Good evening or good afternoon. Uh, welcome back to another lecture. As we've been going through a historical theology series, um, last the last lecture we covered Augustine part one. Uh, we'll be covering part two. Um, so if you have not seen part one, I recommend seeing part one. But basically in this part, we're going to be going out for the back half of Augustine's work on the Trinity. Um, so we're going to be starting in book four. Um, make sure I got my slides rolling here. Okay. Oop. Oh, I see. I have to go. No, that's right. Okay. Sorry about that. Technical issue. All right. So moving to book four, we get further into Augustine's understanding of the missions of the triune God. Important to understanding Augustine's doctrine of eternal processions is his definition of missions. We've already touched on it, but for him, being sent does not mean to be less than the sender. Rather, the Son being sent means he is from the sender, as light is from light. That's a great analogy that we see in the early church fathers is light from light. Obviously, it's also in um, our creeds. Uh, the Father sending the Son and the Spirit is the act of making known the eternal processions in the economy. Uh, the sending of the Son is for the purpose of being known by men that He is from the Father. So if you don't recall what economy is, economy is the manifestation of the triune God in redemptive history. It's the, the outworking of God revealing Himself to creatures. Again, before that, it's the theologia. So the two terms we were looking at was theologia and economia. So theologia, or we could just say theology, refers to the the inner um, element of God. I mean element, I'm sorry, the inner, um, I forgot the word, um, would say the the um, ad intra. So the um, inner essence of who God is that's, that's not visible, that mankind cannot comprehend. So the economy is the manifestation of God in creaturely modes that we can see. I don't mean modes as far as God becomes a creature, but the effects of what God, how God reveals himself, we can ultimately see. So again, the great example would be uh, Jesus' baptism at the Jordan. So we have the second person of the Trinity in the flesh that we can see that's, that's been revealed. We have the, the dove dis descending upon him as the Holy Spirit, right? Taking the form of a dove. And then we hear the Father speaking about his Son from the heavens. So that's the, the creaturely effects that we can hear. And that's God manifesting himself in time and space. So, and thus, the mediating benefit of the Son in reconciling humanity to God, thus giving eternal life to mortals, is knowing that the Son is from the Father, John 17:3. Our comprehension of this, of this is crucial for understanding Augustine's Trinitarian theology. Chapter 5 is where Augustine will flesh out some of the important aspects noted in the previous paragraph. He makes the qualifier that the sender and the one sent, father and the son, only have a distinction of relation, not substantially. They are both fully divine, sharing the same essence. So, substantially would be... Uh, uh, distinct distinct modes of existence. So um, their relation is different, right? But they are the one divine essence. So substantially, they do not have a distinction where to be separate. Otherwise, we'd have a tritheism. So they are both fully divine, sharing the same essence. The Son is the Father's Word who was sent to become flesh. He was sent to become man. Augustine cites the Book of Wisdom, 727, which speaks of a pure outflow of the glory of Almighty God to express that glory of the Son outflows from one and the same substance of the Father. He writes, again, this is Augustine, quote, It is not like water flowing out from a hole in the ground or in the rock, but like light flowing from light. Augustine interprets John 1628, which says, I came from the Father and have come into the world to indicate that the Son flows out from the Father as the brightness of eternal light. His birth from the Father means He is from eternity to eternity, but that He is sent and have come into the world means that He is known by somebody in time. The Word of God as the begotten is sent by the begetter, the Father who sends. A few paragraphs later, Augustine offers speculation about John 17:39 regarding the giving of the Spirit occurring once Jesus is glorified, which leads into an interesting elucidation 
about the essence of the Trinity in our creaturely grasp of the persons by way of a psychological analogy. We're only going to touch on a little bit here, Augustine's, Augustine's work that, uh, on the Trinity. The last four chapters, or five chapters? Five chapters, uh, he really fleshes that out. And again, I didn't, we weren't going to cover this in this lecture. But we'll get a little bit here. Um, so as it pertains to John 7.39, Augustine asks, In what sense is the Spirit given? We see other texts that speak of the Spirit working or being given prior to Jesus' glorification, such as Luke 1.15, Luke 1.46, uh, 67, and then 2.25. He remarks that it must be some unique quality yet not observed, while he is not completely sure about what to conclude. He does say, uh oh, technical issues. Let me go back. Sorry. What's the absolute? Uh oh, what did I do? Careful with absolute in their own. Huh. Sorry, everyone. I definitely skip. Oh, shoot. When? No, it should be here. Okay, I did skip one of the slides. I'm just going to have to read it to you then. Sorry about that. So he says, With absolute confidence, the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, God the Creator, of one and the same substance, the Almighty Three, act inseparably. But they cannot be manifested inseparably by creatures which are so unlike them, especially material ones. In their own proper substance by which they are, the Three are one. Father and Son, and Holy Spirit, without any temporal movement, without any intervals of time or space, one and the same over all creation, one and the same altogether from eternity to eternity. But in my words, Father and Son and Holy Spirit are separated and cannot be said together, and if you write them down, each name has its own separate space. So, excuse me. So what he's seeing, saying here is that we as creatures cannot divide the Godhead. Uh, the, the Godhead divides for us in creaturely language. We can only we can speak of them in this way, but truly, the Almighty Three are inseparable. They are the same substance. They cannot be manifested inseparably, he says, by creatures because we are unlike them. We are material ones. So he's trying to say that even though we do that, ultimately, who they are in themselves, in the divine essence of God, cannot be separated. And then this is when Augustine's now famous psychological analogy makes its first appearance, which he formulates into a theory of, divi of the divine image, which he expounds in Book 10. His purpose with the analogy is to demonstrate how the inseparable three manifest separately in creaturely things, yet the three are inseparably at work in each of the creaturely things, though having the proper function of manifesting one of the three. And he writes, here's my slide. When I name my memory, understanding, and will, each name refers to a single thing, and yet each of these single names is the product of all three. There is not one of these three names which my memory and understanding and will have not produced together. So too the Trinity together produced both the Father's voice and the Son's flesh and the Holy Spirit's dove, though each of these single things has reference to a single person. So obviously when we think of our minds and our memory, our will, um, all of these things, you cannot separate them, but we can just dis make distinctions about them in our own being of who we are. Um, and so again, I think this analogy is very helpful. And if I recall, I don't, I may get to it later, I believe that August, or not Augustine, Aquinas kind of perfects Augustine's analogy here in his works, which he came, you know, a thousand, well, not a thousand, was it? 800 years later, roughly? Yeah. <clears throat> so, anyways. Um, so Augustine ends Book 4 by expressing his satisfaction with his demonstration of the co-equality of the Son and the Spirit with the Father, and that, and that purpose in the visible manifestation of the Son and the Spirit is so that man could see that the Father is the source of in origin of all deity. That's a it's a very main a very big topic uh, within this time frame 
And as we've mentioned before, there was already a split that came later on in 1152, 54, 56, right around there, um, between the East and the West over monotheism, over the relationship of the Son. And so the point is the Father's the source, and the Son is is begotten from that source, though fully God, uh, fully this everything, full, fully deity of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. But the Father is said to be the source. Um, but Augustine, again, he doesn't he doesn't ultimately align with the East. He goes with the West, which is where he kind of really developed this this view that became uh, quintessential to a, a Western view of the Trinity. So, in books five, six, and seven. Augustine focuses his attention on addressing the Arians from the standpoint of reason. So in these three books, we see Augustine's approach to language about God, specifically how to talk about the triune God. That's important, how to talk. Uh, uh, the main, not the main focus, but a big part of what these lectures have covered is, is having this grammar, uh, this, this how-to, when it comes to articulating these definitely um, um, mystical truths, if you will. As we have often observed in this study, the Son's equality with the Father and the Spirit, while maintaining proper distinctions, is the battling ground during this time. In Book 5, Augustine explains a manner of predication about God's nature and his attributes, making the distinctions according to an Aristotelian categorical framework of accidents. So that when we say something of God, we are referring to his very being or essence, not as an accident that he merely has added to him. So to simply say an accident is something attributed to something that's not required or inherent in the thing to be. So as a human, for me to be human, I must have my humanity. But I don't have to have brown hair. I don't have to have any hair. I don't have to be wise. I don't have to be dumb. Those would be accidents. Those don't in a sense, make my humanity be what my humanity is. And so that's the point is, is recognizing there are things that you tack on that don't, that the being, for the being to be are required to be there. That makes sense. We'll, we'll talk more about that here. I got a slide in here. Okay. So these next few slides are going to be important for us as we um, understand Augustine's um, approach of predication, and we'll see him. He kind of he kind of starts out one way, and he kind of moves and, and ends somewhere else. So, <clears throat> so therefore, uh, we would say God's goodness is not an accident as something added to God's nature. Rather, God's goodness is properly His divine substance, and therefore, Augustine attributes all accidents words as substance words when predicating something about God. So again. Uh, goodness is not something as an accident to God. We would say that is who he is. So that's going to be a substance word, not an accident word. I mean, ultimately, God has no accidents. Uh, that's why he's trying to really work through these distinctions. I do this a lot. I'm sorry. I, I don't know. I started doing this, and I don't. I got to stop it. I apologize. Those of you listening, I'm making this little kind of finger movement in the camera. So anyways, next slide. In book six, Augustine wonders... I'm sorry, wonders, considers an exception to this rule of predication in the form of relationship words such as father and son. These words are different than accident words in that they signify relationships within God, not indicative of his substance. And so doing, the divine equality of the persons, though relationally distinct, is established. But this manner of thought is challenged in the Apostle Paul's words from 1 Corinthians 1, 24, when he says Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because in this context and throughout the New Testament, we see substance words used as relationship words in that they seem to have the same manner of expression in phrases such as Son of the Father and Word of the Father. Oops. Augustine, so Augustine then, you would say he prematurely concludes that we must see all words about God as relationship words, except when we say God or substance, which also are properly designated to the Godhead only, not of the persons. But in Book 7, the logic of this approach will reduce God himself to relationship status, thus also making such words as substance and being 
relational terms as well. I don't know if you can see where this is going. This is not good. Therefore, Augustine backtracks to his substance and accident word categories, whereby words like wisdom and power are predicated of the divine substance equally and identically in each of the persons. And so the persons, though relationally distinct, can each have the substance words predicated to them. However, there is an improper manner to avoid, whereby going back to 1 Corinthians 1.24, one would appropriate wisdom to be the Son and God to be the Father. So wisdom is, quote, so appropriate wisdom to be the Son and, quote, God to the Father, to then say that the Father is not wisdom and the Son is not God. And lastly, Augustine considers the terms person and hypostasis which is literally translated as substance, noting that these words cannot be reduced to relationship-only words because we would never say three gods or three wisdoms, but one God. And if you recall, we, we worked through this in, uh, in our lecture on, uh, sorry, um, Nyssa, Nyssa, Greg, Gregory of St. Nyssa. I'm forgetting phrases today. But anyways, we talk about that. I call him the Cappadocian Trio, but Gregory of St. Nyssa, that doesn't sound right. Gregory of Nyssa, there we go. <laughs> Gregory of Nyssa, he works through the On Not Three Gods uh, treatise, which really uh, explains this very well. <clears throat> so go back and, and listen to that. But to avoid the problems as he sees from the East, again, speaking of Augustine, he maintains that the distinction between substance and person is linguistic, not substantive about God. The terms function to keep our divine speech coherent. I believe it was, he's a modern theologian, Stephen Holmes in his book on the Trinity, I forget the exact title of it, but he talks about um, that the purpose of formulating these coherent terms and ways of speaking is not so much about being logic, being logical, but about grammar. And there's a distinction between the two. Because obviously, we come to a point where we can't comprehend things. We're using language to speak of, about what's incomprehensible. So we can't get down to the, the logical, the logical um, grounding of the triunity of God because we, we can't. It's, it's beyond us. So we use the grammar that's logical for us to communicate um, about God's divine essence. So, in Book 5, so before getting to the first chapter of Book 5, Augustine sets the mental tone to this mammoth task ahead. And he says, Thus we should understand God, if we can and as far as we can, to be good without quality, great without quantity, creative without need or necessity, presiding without position, holding all things together without possession, holy everywhere without place, everlasting without time, without any change in himself, making changeable things, and undergoing nothing. Whoever thinks of God like that may not yet be able to discover altogether what he is, but is at least piously on his guard against thinking about him anything that he is not. It's a mouthful, but he basically covers that. We are trying to use terms to speak about God without actually saying what he is, um, without, without tying God's essence to our creaturely terms in the fullness of that term. And I hope that makes sense, because by doing that, we now put God in a grammatical box in a way, if you were, we're in, and we say God is, is not in a box, and it's kind of a, what do you call that, when people say that? God's on a box. It's kind of a cliche term, but our language is meant to describe certain things. And there's the negative descriptions and the positive descriptions of God. In chapter one, Augustine considers the Arian's categorical error by assuming substance distinctions between the unbegotten father and the begotten son, seeing that the unbegotten begotten terms are strictly relational, but as substance modifications between the father and the son, employing the rule that, quote, whatever is said or understood about God is said substance-wise, not modification-wise, end quote. 
In response to this assertion, Augustine writes, quote, I almost knocked my drink over. Whew. He writes, quote, If everything that is said about God is said substance-wise, then from John 10.30, where he says, I and the Father are one, was said substance-wise. He says that, that's the point. That's his assertion back to the Arians. If whatever is said or understood about God is said substance-wise, not modification-wise, then, then this verse here, I and the Father are one, was said substance-wise. So the substance of the Father and of the Son are one. Right Now his point has been proven. The terms unbegotten and begotten are relational terms, thus denoting no change or modification of substance in the persons because the substance is not changeable. Therefore, the substance predicated of the persons is the same in each with the term unbegotten, Purpose to say what the Father is not, and be gotten to say what the Son is. Again, we're talking about relational terms. That's, that's the crux of the matter is that the heretics blur the lines, and they take the relational terms or the created terms, if you will, we'll use that, and uh, imply that that is a one-to-one um, univocal way of describing God. Univocally means that basically if you say he's Son, then he is literally a son and even that word literal doesn't help but the point is we can't tie god properly to the language denoting of who he is in his essence hope that makes sense that's that's the rub of it that's the rub of it that the heretics and those that were orthodoxy were trying of orthodoxy were trying to hash out okay so augustine writes quote being son is a consequence of being begotten, and being begotten is implied by being son. The relate oh, end quote. Sorry, the relationship words have no bearing on the substance words. So, in saying the son is not the father or unbegotten, the denial of relation is not a denial of substance, and that's so important. And again, that's what the Arians were confusing, and that's what the Homoians and all the other um, heretics were doing as well. In chapter 2, Augustine delves further into substantive predications, beginning with the chief point that we must maintain, which is that whatever the divine majesty is called in reference to itself is said substance-wise. Whatever is called with reference to another is said not substance, but relationship-wise. Therefore, whatever is said with reference to self about each of them is to be taken as adding up all three to a singular and not to a plural, end quote. <clears throat> that means, we call each of them God, but they are not three gods. We call each of them great, but they are not three greats. And then Augustine draws an example from scripture to support his point, and he writes this. When the Lord Jesus was accosted just as a man by the young man who said, Good Master, he did not want to be taken for just a man. And so he significantly said, not, quote, no one is good, but the Father alone, end quote, but no one is good but the one God. The name Father signifies only the Father in himself, but the name God includes him and the Son and the Holy Spirit because the one God is a trinity. That's a great passage. So did you catch him on there on the slide, what he was saying? The Father alone peace. He didn't say that. He says, no one is good but the one God, or God alone. <clears throat> okay. So Augustine elaborates further regarding the language used to talk about the being and persons of God. He notes that when he refers to the being of God, he means usia as what the Greeks use, which he understands as substance. The term hypostasis is obscure, and it is too translated as substance, but because we lack the vocabulary to express the divine trinity, we normally use the expression one being or substance, three persons, so hypostasis is not translated as substance in this expression. So when someone asks, quote, three what, we say three persons, not to be precise, but in order to not be reduced to silence. Augustine concludes chapter 2 with a brief exposition on divine simplicity. He returns to the point he was discussing earlier about the greatness of God, noting the differences in the term greatness as it is predicated of various things, which then, 
which when used of such things are not equally understood to be great in the same manner as others. We call things great in which they partake of greatness. Therefore, those things that partake of greatness are not as excellent as those where greatness is primary in them. Where is greatness primary? It's primary in God. However, God's greatness is not something he participates in. Rather, he is great with a greatness by which he is himself the same greatness. And that's Augustine quote. He is great with a greatness by which he is himself the same greatness. So again, he's making a substance-wise um, predication about God. The greatness of God is therefore not predicated of God as three greatnesses. For God, it is the same thing to be as to be great. Augustine's ontology stresses the oneness, thus the simplicity of God as primary, and therefore... God's greatness is great because he is his own greatness. This can be said as well for all predications of God, his goodness, eternity, omnipotence, etc., all absolute in his substance, and that he is properly these things. They are not appended to his divine essence as accidents, as they are in created things. We already covered that about accidents. Chapter 3 continues the discussion of predications looking closely at the relative terms, notably, notably the term gift, regarding the Holy Spirit. The divine names referred to the persons, and the names they are also referred to uh, creation. Also referred to creation. Augustine begins with restating that the triad, this is a quote, sorry, the triad, the one God is called great, good, eternal, omnipotent, and can also be called his own Godhead, his own greatness, his own goodness, his own eternity, his own omnipotence, end quote. And then he contrasts these substance terms with the relative terms, noting that the triad cannot be called father, except metaphorically so in reference to creation because of our adoption as sons. However, there is no denoting any accidents in God using these terms. Augustine notes more examples of relation-wise terms of the Father and the Son, such as the Father being called origin, Father in relation to the Son, and the Son is called word, and image relation-wise, but none of these terms are attributed to the Father. And then the Holy Spirit is called the gift of God. We see this in Acts 8.20 and John 4.10. Specifically of the Father and the Son, because on the one hand, he proceeds from the Father, John 15.26, as the Lord says. And on the other, the Apostles' words, quote, Whoever does not have the Spirit of Christ is not one of his, Romans 8.9, which has been spoken of the Holy Spirit. And so that was an Augustine quote. Augustine sees the Spirit as a, quote, kind of an expressible communion or fellowship of Father and Son, quote, and as gift and giver, the Father and the Son are both Spirit because it is common to them and are only one God, and all is good, great, eternal, and omnipotent. Other terms such as origin is also said of the Spirit in relation to creation because Along with the Father and the Son, they are the one Creator God. But as it relates to the inner being of God, in um, ad intra, we would say, uh, which the distinctions of persons are denoted by their relations, the Father is origin in reference to the Son, since, quote, He produced or begot Him. But Augustine asks about the Spirit, stating whether the Father is origin in respect to him, because he is said to proceed from the Father, John 15, 26. And getting this accurate, Augustine notes, has been a common problem because the question arises as to why the Holy Spirit is not a Son, and that he too comes from the Father. But Augustine sees the relational wise name of the Spirit as gift, so his coming forth is not an eternal birth, as the Son is from the Father. Rather, he is given from the Father and the Son, and he is given to us. Therefore, he is properly called Holy Spirit, and is also, quote, called the Spirit of the Father and the Son who gave him, and also our Spirit who received him, end quote. But do we then see the Father and the Son as two origins, 
if the spirit comes from both. This issue became the wedge between the East and the West, as we've already talked about. The East see that this makes the Father and the Son two origins, thus losing monotheism. But Augustine says they are not two origins because just as the Father and the Son are one God, and with reference to creation, one Creator and one Lord, so with reference to the Holy Spirit, they are one origin. But with reference to creation, Father and Son and Holy Spirit are one origin, just as they are one Creator and one Lord. End quote. Does this serve as the final say on the matter? Now, Augustine moves into deeper waters as he brings chapter 3 to a close, asking the question that pertain to the Spirit's being, as to whether he gets his being in the same way the Son gets his by being, gets his being, I'm sorry, by being born. <laughs> sorry. If the Spirit gets his being as gift by being given, did he have his being before being given? How could he have the divine substance if his being only proceeds when he is given. It sounds like there was a time maybe when the Spirit was not, but obviously we know that's heresy. So Augustine solves this issue by stating that the Holy Spirit always proceeds as gift from eternity, proceeding, quote, as to be givable, end quote. Thus is a gift before it is given and only at a point in time is he a donation. So this actually reminds me of about um, the wisdom of God in, in Proverbs 8 about wisdom sounds like it comes to be uh, when he created everything. Wisdom, wisdom manifests in bringing creation to be. And so um, Jehovah's Witnesses would say, see, there's a time when the wisdom was created. But I think what Augustine is doing here, the same as the Cappadocians did with the wisdom, and, and most of the early church fathers also jumped on board with this, is that the wisdom is there, but it becomes expressed by the outworking of creation. So that the spirit is always there, and it just becomes expressed as donation. Um, Augustine doesn't say that, but I think that's the kind of parallel that he's trying to do, which it makes sense. So chapter 4 takes up the issue of divine immutability closing as he closes book 5. The problem arises as to whether chapter 4 takes up divine immunity. Oh, I said that backwards. So chapter 4 takes up the issue of divine immunity and it comes to a close in book 5. So the problem arises as to whether a modification occurs in God in that since the Spirit is made a donation in time, the title Lord is given to God when creation is brought into being with time. Augustine reasons that God cannot be everlastingly, everlastingly Lord, otherwise we would be forced to say that creation is eternal. So, excuse me, how do we resolve the issue? Augustine says we will be able to maintain that nothing is said of God by way of modification, because in these instances, the substance of God doesn't change. A coin, as an example, has a relationship to other things by way of price, but it doesn't change in its form or value. Therefore, Augustine writes, how much more readily should we be able to accept a similar position about the unchangeable substance of God? He continues emphasizing that relationship status does not produce ontological change. The change that does occur is ultimately in the creature. For example, when we consider Psalm 90 verse 1, Augustine adduces that in the Lord becoming our refuge, he becomes our refuge by relationship. Quote, the name has reference to us, and he becomes our refuge when we take refuge in him. End quote. It is not God who has now become better off in being our refuge. Rather, quote, we were worse before we took refuge in him, and we become better by taking refuge in him, but in him no change at all, end quote. Augustine comments that when we become children of God by his grace, John 1.12, our substance changes for the better in being made his sons, but he, though becoming our father, does not undergo change in his substance. Now regarding God's love for the saints, Augustine writes, It is unthinkable 
that God should love someone temporally, as though with a new love that was not in him, in God before, seeing that with him things past do not pass, and things future have already happened. So he loved all his saints before the foundation of the world, as he predestined them. Excuse me. But when they are converted and find him, then they are said to begin to be loved by him in order to state the thing in a way that can be grasped by human feeling. End quote. And this goes for other dispositions God has towards creatures, which are experienced differently in the creature based on the relation to him, not God to them. God is light, and light can be harsh to weak eyes, but pleasant to the strong. All right, now we're in book six. This book is very short. It's only nine pages. But in this piece, Augustine considers the problem of appropriation. Using 1 Corinthians 1.24, which says, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God, as his pretext for the discussion, he briefly addresses Arius' well-known statement about the Son. If he was born, then there was a time when he was not. And as we've already seen throughout this study, Arius and his ilk do not understand the Son's birth as an everlasting birth, what we call an affiliation. Not affiliation, sorry, filiation is the term. Denoting the son's relationship to the father, which the father has paternity. So these are Latin terms. Thus he is co-eternal with him. Again, the language, the terms, are to describe the relationship. So 1 Corinthians one twenty four is a key proof text to refute this claim because the Nicene tradition understands wisdom and power to be substance-wise terms, which are predicated of God's very essence. Therefore, if the Son is the wisdom and power of God, and, as Augustine remarks, quote, it is crazy to say, end quote, God could have been without those, then we conclude that he could never have been without his Son. Therefore, there is no time when the Son did not exist. But Augustine must tackle a problem he discerns in the appropriation of terms. The issue is whether such appropriation means that the Father can, quote, only be wise by having the wisdom which he begot, not by being in himself very wisdom, end quote. So, Augustine wonders if the Son can be wisdom from wisdom, as the Nicene Creed states, he is God from God, light from light. And if wisdom is something the Father begets, then why can't he beget his own power, wisdom, goodness, etc.? That is definitely a very interesting quandary to be in. Is the Father only called the Father? I'm sorry, is the Father only called what he is in reference to the Son, so he would only be great in be begetting greatness in the Son, just in begetting justice in the Son, powerful in begetting power in the Son, so on and so forth, and likewise in turn for the Son? If this is so, I got flindled up. Augustine writes, quote, Then it follows that whatever they are called with reference to themselves, neither is called without the other. That is, whatever they are called to indicate their substance, they are both called together. End quote. Augustine concludes that the Father and the Son are not God apart from each other. Quote, they are both God together. Therefore, he says, we must interpret John one interpret John one one. In the beginning was the Word, to mean in the Father was the Word, because though the Son is the Word, the Word is the image of the Father, and both cannot be the image. The Son is the Word alone and was with God. However, the Father is not the Father alone, but the Father and the Son are both God together. But there are concerns in the coherency of this statement. How do we address the difficulty? Augustine makes a mind-body analogy to solve the dilemma. He writes, You could say the mind was with the man, that the man, that is in the man, though the mind is not body, while man is both mind and body together. So we could understand what follows. And the word was God, as meaning that the word, which is not the Father, was God together with the Father. End quote. But how does this reconcile with the creedal phrase, God from God, light from light? Augustine concludes that the creedal affirmation 
is a nutshell statement of the Son's co-eternality with the Father. And so only the terms uniquely appropriated to the Father and the Son cannot be phrased in the same way as in the Creed. The purpose is to denote the relationship of the Son with the Father to make a distinction in the divine essence which is eternal. Quote, the begetter did not proceed what he begot. End quote. The Father cannot be called word from word or image from image because those terms are appropriated to the Son only. I hope that makes sense. That word image, so that word and image is only appropriate to the Son, proper of the Son. But God from God, light from light, is proper to both of them. So that's how the creedal phrase can make that statement and encapsulate or nutshell the Father, the Son, and the Spirit of sharing these things. The Father and the Son are not both word or image together. Therefore, when we look at the passage of John 10.30, which says, I and the Father are one, Augustine says, quote, Our one means what he is that I am too by way of being, not by way of relationship. End quote. We're talking about the ad intra, the essence. They are that by the essence, but they are not that by relationship. <clears throat> well, yeah, okay. Augustine's aim is to demonstrate that the Son is equal to God, and in looking at the attributes, you know, his greatness, wisdom, power, eternity, etc., belonging properly to the substance which the Father and Son share, then none of these attributes can be any more or any less in the Son or the Father. The Father cannot be greater than the Son because his greatness is the Son, who, however, cannot be greater than the one uh, who begot him. His point is to say that if the Son is not equal in any one thing, then he is not equal at all. However, his opponents say, quote, but the scripture cries out, he did not think it robbery to be equal with God. Philippians 2, 6. That's uh, end quote. But Augustine puts his adversary in a trap. If he affirms the authority of the Apostle Paul, then he must affirm that the Son is at least equal with God in one thing. And if equal in one then he must be equal in all as it pertains to his substance. Augustine elaborates further, contrasting the human essence to the divine essence, invoking simplicity which constitutes the divine being of God. Human essences are composite, so a human being has a human nature. Thus, one human being is not the human nature, whereas God does not have a divine essence, but he is the divine essence. In fact, he is existence itself. To press this point further, Augustine notes that the human spirit has human virtues, which vary in each person, such as courage, wisdom, justice, etc. And the human can have one or none of these virtues, but it does not mean he is no longer human or that his humanness diminishes or goes out of existence. Having all these virtues equally is not necessary for a human being to exist. God created human nature to have such virtues accidentally, as we've been talking about that, accidentally, not properly to their natures. In the divine essence, however, quote, it is the same thing to be powerful or just or wise or anything else that can be said about his simple multiplicity or multiple simplicity to signify his substance, end quote. It's kind of a strange phrase. His simple multiplicity or multiple simplicity. That is the difference between composite beings, as created essences are, and the simple being, as the uncreated essence is. And therefore, Augustine concludes in the apostle calling the Son equal to God, then, quote, the Son is equal to the Father in every respect and is of one and the same substance, end quote. Now, regarding the Holy Spirit, he too shares in the same substance. substance. <coughs> Excuse me. And as the love of God, which the Spirit is, so also God is love. John 1, uh, 1 John 4, 8. The Spirit too is God's substance, and the Spirit has all the attributes fully, equally, and completely as proper to the divine essence. Therefore... Augustine writes, Just as it is substance together with the Father and the Son, 
So it is great together and good together and holy together with them and whatever else is said with reference to self, because with God it is not a different thing to be and to be great or good, etc. So the Holy Spirit is equal to, and if equal, equal in every respect on account of the total simplicity which belongs to that substance. End quote. Excuse me. So in chapter 2 of book 7, Augustine examines divine simplicity further to reconcile it with the triunity of God. He first explains how a created substance, quote, is multiple and in no way truly simple, end quote. I'm sorry, not, I didn't, I said book 7, sorry, book 6, book 6. Um, let me make the sentence again. So he first explains how a created substance is multiple and in no way truly simple in that it has size, color, and shape. You know, these are parts of which any one of those can change while the other parts remain the same. All parts can change or individual parts can change without the others. However, a, quote, spiritual creature such as the soul, end quote, while it is simple in comparison to a created substance, nevertheless, it is still multiple. The reason it is considered simple compared to the body, Augustine writes, is because it has no mass spread out in space but in any body, as it is whole in the whole and whole also in any part of the body. End quote. And the soul's wholeness means that when the body is affected, the whole soul is aware of it, just the whole soul is aware of it, not just a little part of it. That was a typo for my end. With that said, in the soul there are parts, and that it can be ingenious, unskillful, have good memory, it can fear, have joy, it's be sad, etc. And all these things can be in the soul without the other quality. Quote, countless qualities can be found in the soul in countless ways, end quote. Thus, its nature is not simple, but multiple. So Augustine concludes saying this, Nothing simple is changeable, everything created is changeable. So in Augustine, we have a definition of simplicity with the necessary corollary, corollary, I hate that word, corollary, I hate corollary, and corroborate. Anyways, corollary of immutability inherent in that which is simple, and that which is created is mutable, therefore, therefore all creatures are multiple. <laughs> Excuse me. However, God is called multiple in the sense that his ways are great, good, wise, blessed, true, and any other perfection, perfection proper to him. And while he is multiple in his ways, which he manifests to us in his external acts or his effects, the phrase ad extra, in his essence, ad intra, Augustine says each of these qualities are identical with each other. So, revealed ad extra, external acts or the effects, they are multiple, but in his essence, ad intra, these qualities are identical with each other. So his wisdom is identical with his greatness, his goodness with his wisdom and greatness, his truth identical with them all. Augustine then explains how his triunity does not entail multiplicity. While we can talk of each person individually, each of the persons are inseparable from one another and are, quote, always in each other and neither is alone, end quote. And so, when we speak of the one, when we speak of one of the persons, we do so to indicate their distinction from each other, not separation from each other. That's key, right? We speak of the persons. We're indicating distinctions, not separation from one another. All right. Now we're in the book seven. In this book, Augustine revisits and solves the problem he spoke of in the previous book, book six, which is the appropriation of wisdom and power as predicated of the sun, which he determined are substance-wise predications. And more specifically, Augustine addresses whether we can predicate these attributes to each person by himself or only in the Trinity. He notes the linguistic and thus the logical problem that we run into. Are we to conclude that God is the father of his wisdom and his power, 
in the eternal begetting of the Son? That's the question. It says, Can the Father be said to be wise singly, and is indeed his own wisdom? If the Father is only wise or powerful because of his begetting of the Son, quote, then the Father is not anything with reference to himself, end quote. Now, Augustine obviously wants to avoid being cornered by the language he has used to express the inexpressible. The language is blurring the predication, thus bringing about unexpected and untenable conclusions, whereby we are forced to assume that the Son is called being by way of relationship and the Father likewise. And therefore, being is then not being. Rather, it is relationship. We want to not go that route. If relationship, then we cannot predicate properly, nor anything as proper to any one or thing. We do not have an origin to which we can reference. For example, if we are to say a man is a master, we point to his relationship to a slave. But man is predicated as man with reference to himself qua man. And so, if the relationship is being, then being is not being. Augustine must do undo this substance relation Gordian knot. So what is the way forward? So he makes a deductive move. Move. He notes that what is called by relationship with something must be something in reference to itself. Otherwise, we do not know what the relationship is predicating. Right? We have to have an origin, a source, to say what is this relationship. So then, as the father is called father in relationship to the son... That which is father must be something with reference to himself. Otherwise, quote, there is absolutely nothing there to be talked of with reference to something else, end quote. But Augustine qualifies the uniqueness of the situation in that it is not the same such as a color of something. A color is only a color of that which is predicated the color of, as in a man's body is white, a man's body is black. With that said, a body's color is not its being. Quote, body signifies its being, end quote. And whiteness is a quality therein, quote, since it is not the same for it to be and to be white, end quote. But, quote, wisdom is both wise and wise with itself, end quote. In that, quote, a soul becomes wise by participating in wisdom, but it then becomes unwise but I'm sorry, but if then if it then becomes unwise, wisdom remains in itself. End quote. Now color, on the other hand, simply ceases to be when a body changes to another color. Because of the simple being that God is, to say that the Father begets wisdom to then become wise with it would mean he is not the same as his wisdom, because his son, the begotten, would be a quality of his not his offspring. So you see where he's going with this, right? We don't want the son to be a quality of God, right? He's his offspring in an eternal relational way. So back to what he says. says, And if, well, he doesn't say this. This is just me uh, providing an exposition. And if for God, it is the same for him to be and to be wisdom, then if the father begot wisdom, then it, then it is wisdom that begot him. It's not good. Now we're going to this univocal thing where we're saying God and wisdom are the same from that standpoint and that wisdom begot wisdom. And then the cause of his being wise is the cause of him being at all. And such a conclusion is absurd, nor would anyone even consider thinking such a thing. Augustine concludes, therefore, for God to be wise must be his wisdom. Thus, the Father is himself wisdom and the Son is called the wisdom of the Father in the same way as he is called the light of the Father. That is, that as we talk of light from light, and both are one light, so we must understand wisdom from wisdom and both one wisdom. And therefore, also one being, because there is there to be is, sorry, one being, because there to, gosh, there to be is the same, they, I must have had a typo, sorry about that. And therefore also one being, because there to be is the same as to be wise. What being wise is for wisdom, and being powerful for power, and being eternal for eternity, 
being just for justice, being great for greatness, that simply being is for being. And because in that ultimately simplicity, to be is not different from to be wise, their wisdom is the same as being. End quote. So he resolves the problem. While he deduced the attributes in God to God's being, and thus are in fact the same as being in God, the linguistics of the Father and the Son as denoted by relationship are not the same. The Father and the Son are not the Word because the Father is not the Son. However, they are both wisdom and they are both power, which can be predicated of each singly. The Son is not the Word as he is wisdom. He is only Word by relationship to hers whose word he is. Again, that's that ground that he's talking about. Again, so he is wisdom because he is only word. The son is not the word as he is wisdom because he is only word by relationship to whose word he is. The word is a relation-wise term and wisdom is a substance-wise term. And in closing, addressing the unbegotten begotten problem of predication in that in the Arians, that is, Augustine writes, quote, it, is, it does not follow that because the Father is not the Son, nor the Son the Father, one is unbegotten, the other begotten, that therefore they are not one being. For these names only declare their relationships, end quote. Man, that's a lot. You know, that last quote, this last slide on the screen, is going to take some time to digest, but... We are wrapped up here. Um, in conclusion, I heard an historian, I want to say it was um, Michael Hakins. I think he said something like, he says, if you get into Augustine, you will never get out. And he was speaking about the, the massive amounts of literature Augustine produced. Um, now I say that because what we looked at here, these last couple hours of lecture, like these two parts, just scratches the surface to his corpus of writings. Um, one of the reasons why Augustine is so voluminous is because he had his own uh, amanuensis, uh, you know, scribe or note taker. So as he has these ideas, he's just talking. So everything he's speaking, teaching, lecturing, conversing about is being written down. So I guess if you just think about that, if you're just every thought, every every poignant thought you had a theologically, philosophically, you know, biblically, and you're just saying these things, it's all being written down. So I don't know if there's that way for everything you wrote. I don't think so, but I know that was a reason why he ultimately wrote so much. So, but with that said, I hope that we've gone through these last couple of lectures. I've distilled the key aspects of some of his theology, especially about the doctrine of God, divine simplicity, uh, the Trinity. Uh, but he is ultimately a towering mammoth figure in the christian tradition like he still is people are still doing dissertations on him original monographs on him i mean all kinds of stuff and a lot of his work is still in latin being translated in english um so his, inf his influence is just really i mean it's just pivotal to the, to the western world um so we're very very thankful to augustine and what he's contributed to the christian faith we're ultimately thankful to the wisdom that the lord has given him that he did give him to really help advance uh, the Christian tradition. So, so last slide here, these are the books that we looked at. Um, well, conf Confessions we did. So on here is City of God, um, Confessions, the Trinity, and then his select letters. Again, you can find all this stuff free online, but these are the actual books that I I own and I've gone through. I do have a, a new version of Augustine's City of God, which is supposed to be the more um, most not accurate translation but most current one I actually i prefer this older one i like the way the way the way it's the style but better but anyways uh great great books i definitely recommend you guys getting them and just spending time and going through it. his work on the trinity is a 20-year mammoth work it's just an absolute uh, uh just a watershed book it's really a pivotal book for understanding the doctrine of the trinity so again thanks for uh joining us and i will see you in our next lecture take care